you have made a request that you would like to attend Judge Prinsloo case management tomorrow afternoon. She starts at three o'clock. Quarter past. Uh, we we can try and work that in, that you that you go to see her in action and the case management in action. I was also asked to present or make representations to you on Friday. Friday, I've notified the JP already um, during the weekend. Until now, I did not get a response from him, but I accept that it is, it is accepted that I will not present lectures to you on Friday. I, the reason for that is the following. I have an uh, interlocutory matter that I hear from 9 o'clock, which I cannot give to another judge. And then at 10 o'clock, my residual court roll start. And my suggestion was that on Friday, I will keep, say, 10 to 15 matters on my roll, which I will not complete before and make orders before. I will select some of the matters, keep it on the roll, and then you will be required to attend the residual court matters on Friday morning from 10 onwards at the Sadek building. That is where my court is situated. And if we are going to do it that way, I will expect all of you to attend the court. And I will make the matters, I will reduce the matters so that I can conduct the proceedings so that you can relate to the things that I divulge to you today and tomorrow when you see the court in action. I will then ask legal practitioners, uh, a case will be called, legal practitioners will arise. You will hear the, uh, from some of them, not all of them, please. You will hear the, the parrot like I submit the paper sign order and I ask for judgment. And then you will, you will find that some of the judgment are granted and some of them, the from the bench they will experience questions. Address me on this, address me on that, address me on that. And then you have an opportunity to see, to, to see how the court work in practice. Would you like to do that? Uh, I am also advised by Lorraine, for some other reason I thought that maybe this type of presentation and the one that was given this morning, I thought that that would not be the subject to an examination. But I'm told that I am probably wrong. Uh, so, if I then advance and supply the judge president with possible questions, I will try that it is as practicable as possible. For example, uh, I can tell you, I don't know how the matter will look. I might uh, present papers to you from a case that was already in front of the court, or I will sort out up something and present papers to you, a summons, a particulars of claim, and then a question. If an application 
for default judgment is made when it's made in court, will or will you not grant it and then you must give the reasons. And then I think this type of lecture and your experience on, on Friday will help you to apply your mind on the matter and dissect the matter. What, what will you do? And I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if a judge takes his work very seriously, we remain humane as do a magistrate and we sometimes overlook crucial matters because of the volume of the work that you are inquired to work through. Uh, and I'm sure if this type of question will be one of the questions that will be asked to you in practical examinations, that some of your insight might surprise me very positively. Uh, so <coughs> it's always a matter apply your mind, be dissective, be investigative. I know we don't want to hear it. We don't have time for that, but it's our duty. Ms. Savage, you wanted to ask me a question. And then, and then a party do not file a plea, then the matter is not referred back to a residual court role, then the case management just, judge deal with that uh, default judgment application when it comes. Then it will not be on a Friday, but in my instance it will be on a Monday, or in Judge Prinsloo's instance it will be on a Thursday. But then because a matter was referred to case management, after it's referred to case management, it stay with that judge concerning interlocutory applications and, and any relevant applications or legal proceedings to that matter that was allocated to a managing judge, it stay with that managing judge. Also a default in respect of where a party do not find, uh, do not file a plea. And then it can only be a simple matter where a part party did not file a plea uh, that the plaintiff then asked for default judgment in terms of Rule 15.2, the second part, but usually that 15.2, Rule 15.2, then is coupled with... The other thing that I want to tell you, if you have good eyes now, when you are doing a lot of cases on e-justice, expect that you will wear glasses very soon. Uh, now, it's Rule 54, Sub-Rule 3, where a party fails to deliver a pleading within the time stated in the case plan order, or within any extended time allowed by the managing judge, that party who failed to file the pleading is in default of filing such pleading and is by that very fact barred from filing that pleading. And usually then the plaintiff will come, and usually the plaintiff, there's cases it, it might be the defendant, but the plaintiff will come in terms of 54 sub 3 and 15 2 and ask for default judgment. And then we, we, we consider the condemnation application. And if we grant condemnation, then the party can go on. In, in, in the next, either the next case plan is then uh, delivered or agreed upon between the parties and made an order of court but then they must adhere to that. You will find it, you will find it in, in case management <coughs> that a lot of times there is minor transgressions of a case plan and of time periods granted by the court. And then 
the presiding judge, having a discretion, must make a selection. And you make that selection depending on a lot of factors, but you also do it concerning the overriding objective in the rules, Rule 1, Sub Rule 3, and the application thereof from, I think, Rule 17 onwards. Uh, if you want to be finicky, the letter, the dot of an order, and there's a transgression of, of that order, you might expect from the parties each time to bring a condonation application. When they bring a condonation application, and that you, you, will, you will see in, in Rule 56, there's a lot of things that they must uh, comply with. And one of, one, of, one of the things they must comply with, they must show good cause. And in our jurisprudence, good cause mean that the party applying for condonation must make out not only a good case for the condonation, but a good case on the merits of the matter. And most of them don't do it in their, their application for condonation. But you as a judge have a discretion and taking into account the overriding objective that you want to case manage a, a case cost effectively and speedily as possible to the end of the matter. Minor transgressions I tend to oversee and the parties can ask me orally or they can ask me by way of a status report uh, whether I will excuse it. Or they can agree with the other party that they will ex excuse it. Uh, and then ask me to condone it, and then I will condone it, because I want the case to go on. Uh, if there's more severe transgressions, yes, you will expect a proper application for condonation. But again, and most of you know it because you sit a long time already as judicial officers. You apply discretion all the time. Minor things you let go, you want to carry on. You quickly start to see which parties and which legal practitioners in front of you give attention to their work and who not. You, and, and then you you will, in your mind, uh, you know whether a certain party is prone not to be very conscientious with their work. Then, when applying Rule 56, you will see under Rule 56, then the extent of previous transgressions also play a part. But that is when you go the, one of my brethren say, the correct way to expect each and every time a proper condonation application on a notice of motion. I do not, because in my discretion, I rather apply the overriding objective to case management cases until the end. We also have benchmarks, that's just general. Time limits in which to case manage a, a case until the end. But because of our lack of capacity at the moment, there's too, less, too few judges for the ac civil action floating roles and case management roles, the number of cases, and it's so, so many, you, you cannot, for the best of you, you cannot stay within that benchmark. But we must stay as near as possible to it. And then sometimes this interlocutory applications and interim condemnation applications just a quick a, a waste of time. Because usually parties then expect you must give them a hearing date for a matter 
you must hear it. You are the managing judge. They want to file heads of argument. They become very clever in court with papers and papers and reams of papers of a lot of the time cut and pasting work. And they deliver you with pleadings and then you must give a judgment within 10 or 15 days. But you cannot because of the volume of the work and this interlocutory condonation applications at the end of the day take a lot of your time and it wastes a lot of time. By the time you had the second one, the case could have been completed if you was just standing behind the case, make variation orders, go on with the case. But, but obviously if a party don't file a plea, and transgress a court order once or two, you apply, you apply the rules if you are so requested by the plaintiff and do not uplift the automatic bar in terms of rule uh, 54 sub 3 and default judgments then, then granted at the end of the day against that party. If it was only a pleading, but to give you an overview, that is why I think it's not always so expedient just to talk to trainees about the demarcated subject that you must address them on Be because we must go over, over the lines to make it meaningful for you. Then what I want to mention to you, you will also look at Rule 53, 1 and 2 concerning transgressions in pleadings and or case orders. Then we have a thing that's, that's uh, commonly known in, in or between the judges as sanctions hearings. Some judicial officers have a lot of sanction hearings, some less, depending on how you apply your discretion. Depending on whether it can be postponed to rectify the matter, or whether the summons and or particulars of claim should be reconstituted, you will either get a postponement, then you remain on the residual court role for a next hearing or a next hearing. Uh, if, for instance, you, you, you sat and before your matter is called, you see, my word, the return of service is completely wrong. And in Annexion 9, we have submitted to the court that the papers are in order. Then you raise as a good officer of the court, not a litigant that try to capture his judgment at all costs. But as an officer of court, then it's your duty to tell the judge, judge, despite my submission on, on paper in front of you that the paper are in order, it's not. I just realized that the return of service is defective. Then the matter will be removed from the role, reason return of service defective. Then you place it on the roll again in practice. You go again through specific mo motions. You must file either on paper, but nowadays it's only e-justice. You file your, your notice in terms of Rule 15.4. Your notice of set down, you file that. You file your draft order. You file your uh, I was this morning looking at a lot of the things. It's your it's your draft order, your notice of set down, uh, and if there must be a damages affidavit, that must be filed. I, I set the draft order and your annexion nine. Your annexion nine is there. It's, it's a paper that's devised. It's not to put the matter on the roll. It is there for the attorney or the legal practitioner 
to, after all the papers is filed, sometimes they do it simultaneously, but then they have all the papers with them. They review the papers, service in order, uh, the material matters on the particular, it's all in order and then you make the submission on an action night. But there must still be a notice uh, in, in terms of Rule 15.4. But if a matter is postponed, you don't have to file a notice for default judgment again. You don't have to file an annexure 9 again. You don't have to file a draft order again. Because when the judge postponed the matter to a next hearing, he keep it on the roll. So the only action in, 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 in your example then required from you is uh, get the deputy sheriff to, to provide you with a correct return of service. And if the service itself was defective, to have that rectified and when that is done, uh, the matter be uploaded, but I, again then, in, in my view, you have to file an annexure 9-2 if the matter was postponed. If the matter was removed, you have to file all the papers again. Yes, but then you have to uh, reconstitute against the second defendant and make the necessary averments. Then he can come again. But then he must go through the whole process. If the particulars of claim is not only uh, in minor issues amended, the summons must be amended, the particulars of claim must be amended, maybe I had a problem with the con constitution of the particulars of claim, it comes down to a reconstitution, making additional averments in the particulars of claim then the correct papers must be reserved. The whole process start de novo. In matters like that, you will normally have removed the matter from the role or struck it from the role with the reasons. And then the litigant or the legal practitioners must make up their mind. How do they want to change the papers? And either the whole process begin again, or if there's, uh, in the summons for instance, the summons say the residential address of the second defendant, let's go to that scenario, the residential address of the second defendant is number 444 Kivit Street, uh, Klein Windhoek or something. But for some other reason, and that reason is normally cutting and pasting of documents by secretaries, they then appear on the summons uh, or on the particulars of claim, triple four, Kivit Street, uh, Ludwigsdorf, something. If that it's a minor change, they can go to the, they can go to the registrar and ask for a deletion of that word, a rectification thereof, and get a signature of the registrar on the side of the summons. Then it's amended, but then they must serve it again. Sometimes they don't serve the summons again, but they serve the particulars of claim again. But that can only happen with minor changes. But the moment that something was lacking on the particulars of claim, like let's go to the innocent spouse matter again. If they want to continue against that second defendant, they must reconstitute their summons and their particulars of claim, serve it de novo. They can then get judgment in the end if their particulars of claim is correct. So the door is not closed. Look, if judgment was not given, it does not say they cannot come again. If, if, 
No, if, if the matter is reconstituted for the second defendant, they can come again against the second defendant. No, if they have, if they have judgment against the first defendant, it's, that's we need to, that's done with. But, but uh, Ms. Mokumela will tell you that a lot of legal practitioners try to uh, convert and what is the other nice, beautiful English work? Uh, they want to come with the same papers again, but if the material changes, it must be served again. Let's quickly go to service, because I am not going to stay here until five o'clock. Uh, because when I, left my, when I left my office, there were still 43 cases on my default judgment row. Uh, let's, let's quickly go to service. You will see most, the most of the mistakes when a default matter appears in front of you on the residual court is that there's one or other problem with the return of service or a problem with the service, whether the service was done properly. But, and now I want to take you in a reverse order to Rule 9, not Rule 8. I want to take you to Rule 9 first. And then refer you to Rule 9, Sub-Rule 4. And make that the starting point. Not satisfied as to the effective, effectiveness of service, it may order any further steps that it considers practicable and reasonable to be taken. Start with that. Now you will see, keep that Rule 9, Sub Rule 4 in mind with, again, the things that we already discussed. You must be sure uh, the things that we already discussed concerning the, the main objective of lit litigation and uh, and fairness to the parties that still play a role. You must be sure that the entity or the person that was due to be served or required to be served that if the rules is followed that the service was effective. Now, from that scenario, I again, in my court, would be less prone to say that the specific wording of Rule 8 must be followed and must appear on a return of service. Even if the specific wording is not followed, and I'm of the impression, looking at the papers, the circumstances surrounding, and you get that in the main papers, the particulars, the summons, uh, I'm of the view that, look, the defendant got service. This service should have been brought to his attention. I will condone a minor deviation from the exact wording of, of a rule. But the essence must be there. You cannot, for instance, have in a return of service in front of you uh, that the deputy sheriff has served on a close corporation. Look at 
rule 8, sub rule 3, sub A, the deputy sheriff have served in terms of that rule 8, sub 3, sub A, by handing a copy of the process to a responsible person over the age of 16, uh, blah, blah, blah. That is not what is required. Usually, if on a company or body corporate service is to be effected there, you have, uh, you have a, a registered office or a principal place of business. And the registered office usually at a firm of auditor. It's never at the main place of business of that company. So now you serve on a registered office. Now there might be, the registered office, office might be mentioned in the summons and in the particulars of claim as, now I want to think about the example I got many of times. Uh, Marua Mall South Block C. That's it. That is the registered address. The allegation of the registered address. Now, if the deputy sheriff go there and he, he serve on a responsible person, and that you will see in a lot of returns of services. They don't say a responsible employee. They think it's the same as a responsible person. But now looking at the circumstances. In the summons and the particulars of claim does not, does not say third floor office 11A. does not say that. Now on the return of service, you have the return of service on a registered uh, place of business. Uh, it's mentioned. Marua South Block C responsible person. Now think again about rule 9 sub 4. How can that be effective? It is common knowledge how big the buildings there are. And if the deputies, deputy go there and I give it to a person in that building, which look to him as a responsible person, it can be anyone that look older than 16, what is the chance that that process will come to the attention of the defendant, almost zero. If the address was cited differently, a floor, an office number, then you can give more consideration to the effectiveness if it's there given at a responsible person. But to be on the safe side, that is one instance where one would expect a responsible employee of the business to receive service and not only a responsible person, but as the rule provide an employee. Uh, if we look, and I, I know there's a different approaches to this rule too. If we look at rule 8, to C, for instance. If the address given in the particulars and summons is an address of employment of a person, service must be on a at the employment place, a person who is apparently not less than 16 years of age and apparently in authority 
over the person to be served. Again, you, you cannot, if you serve on an employment address, you know that the, the, the defendant is the CEO. That is alleged in the particulars of claim. He's the CEO of that company. Now, you come to uh, the office, the place of employment, and serve on a responsible person over the age of 16, which is also employed there. It just does not gel. It must be a person apparently in authority. And that must then be alleged. Otherwise, if it's a very angry manager or something, do you, do you think the cleaning lady will go and give the summons to a boss? Not at all. <laughs> File 13. <coughs> uh, we, we can kick off tomorrow morning with other examples of service because that is a very important part. What I would like you to do for me, don't study the whole night, I know it will not be done, but somewhere between now and when you go to sleep or early tomorrow morning when you wake up, take half an hour, but then apply your mind on rule eight. Apply your mind on rule eight. And then we go further with service tomorrow morning. I will go and recap and rethink what still is important that I must conduct with you and what, what I will give examples for questions uh, to the JP. Uh, because we are not complete now with the residual calls. But tomorrow we will go over to 108. I did not think about this scenario that you attend the court of Judge Prinsloo tomorrow, but, but I'm in favor of that, as I am in favor that you come to my court on, on, on Friday at 10, uh, because it, it will give you some practical uh, experience and tie in with one of the other rules that I, until now, did not specifically mention, but I think about a quick example. Uh, service on a farm. Now, very specific things that happened, and it happened regularly. The defendant is a farmer. The defendant place of residence is mentioned in the summons and particulars of claim as uh, farm Karigas Irongu region uh, with a number, farm so and so, with a number. District of, this is commas, district of Isakos. Now you get a return of service. The return of service say, uh, and that farm is not only as place of residence, but say also as a domicilium sitandi. Now the return, let's go to the example, it's a domicilium sitandi. Now the return of service come back and say, in terms of Rule 8, 2, D, I have left a copy of the process at farm, carigas, number, irongu, blah, blah, by affixing it to the gate of the farm. Look, that's a domicilium address. Practically speaking, then, because I must 
be satisfied in terms of 9.4, that it was effective, then my question is, how far is the homestead from the gate of the farm? Which gate of the farm? Is the homestead not three or four or two kilometers inside? Is it a private road or a public road going in front of the farm? Is there many traffic? Is there a lot of people walking around? What set, how can I be satisfied that it was an effective service, service even as a domicilium sitandi? What is the chances of farmer A ever getting that service? In the, the uh, area where I live outside Bentuk, it is Nubuamis Hills, and I, I know how it looked there. And I once or twice already, once I had the experience passing a big flat rock, which was not at the entrance of the nearby plot, but it was at the road split. And on the, on the flat stone, there's a number of that plot. But the homestead is still 700 meters further with a lot of bushes in between. I drive past because then I, I must turn left. I saw this lot of papers there on the flat rock. I stopped and I looked at it. And... I saw, no, no this, this is service. There's court processes affixed to that flat stone. Now, it would have been interesting to see what the deputy sheriff will certify in his return of service. Because that poor woman, it's a very specific thing many months ago, she was not even there at the stage when that paper were affixed there. And then th I knew she was not there. And then the next morning, the next morning, the only the night was in between. When I passed down, I looked for this lot of papers. It's gone. It's gone. And because of my... My brothers living in the informal part of Havana, only one mountain in between, there's a lot of people walking in the felt, looking for firewood. Obviously, if they find a lot of papers, they, they will take it. Because they cannot buy something, they don't have a job, they take it. How will that process ever come to the knowledge of whomever it was intended for? So, again, the investigative mind, we must be practical when sitting in court. If the return of service don't tell you a story of effectiveness, rather query, rather be on the safe side. And usually you get that in... in, in uh, farming communities, uh, that you must be very careful. I had one deputy sheriff, now I will not say a region that, there's two deputy sheriffs in Namibia. They like the word personal. They like the word personal. They think if they put personal in their return of service, as many times as possible, the judicial officer will be satisfied. Now this dep deputy sheriff say, on so-and-so date, I personally went to so-and-so address and personally effected service by attaching this process personally <laughs> to the main entrance of this dwelling or address because I could not find anyone 
willing to accept service. Uh, there's two of them. While I'm there, while, while we are with this question of, uh, of what did I think about, yeah, about service on, 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 on domicilium sitandis. If you look at rule 8, okay, rule, 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 rule 8, 4, sub 4. Where at any premises contemplated in sub rule 2 or 3, no person is willing to accept service. Willing to accept service. Service may be effected by affixing a copy of the process to the main door, or if not accessible, any, any other place to which the public has access. That open service it opens service up, but still keep in mind your discretion in terms of Rule 9 sub 4. But what does Rule 8 sub Rule 4 say? I must go to any address in 8, 2 or 3. No person must be willing to accept service. Now think what we find in practice. We find in practice a lot of times, I could not find any person on the premises. So I attach it to this or this. It's not strict compliance with the rule. Then you must look again at, at circumstances because the word willing to accept have a purpose. I come to a place It's the place of Armon Duplessis. It's his place of residence, but also his domicilium, as in bank documents. Now I come there and I find his beautiful daughter Cecilia there. She looked to me that she might be 20, 20 something. Uh, She's not willing to accept service. But now I saw her, I tendered service, she didn't want to take it, she know now about the documents. I said, fine lady, take my hammer and nail against the main door. She know about it. She was not willing to accept service. But there's a person knowing about it. The other scenario is you find nobody. The place look uninhabited. Then the judge or the judicial officer at the end of the day in terms of 9-4 should apply discretion. Was it probably effective or not? But there the word willing denotes someone beer knowledge. If you just go there and put it against the door, there's no compliance with this supper. The deputy sheriffs are complaining a lot, and you heard it already, even in your courts. They complain a lot. They say every time, and every judge and or any magistrate have his own interpretation of the rules. Sometimes they validly complain. Most of the times not. They must do their work as we must do our work. Their work is to effect services of process. They are also officers of the court. They should not just draft something to us and give it back to the attorneys to, to put on our dashboards or uh, on our paper files. And we are the watchdogs. And it's the only one that unrepresented and maybe non-knowledgeable person, 
that, that process was ever initiated against him of her, have that stand between them and the judgment. Uh, colleagues in training, that will be the end of today. We will see each other tomorrow morning uh, at 9. It will be full tomorrow. But what I assure you, we will come through all the work, all the main parts of the work. You will have a feeling for the processes. And then uh, I will not, I will not, if I must draft questions, I am not going to tender any questions that is there to catch anyone out. We are adults. We have a certain mission in life. We have reached a certain stage in our respective lives. We want to advance. Uh, I'm not a school teacher that you have already seen. What I want to, to give out to you I will leave it here, one or two will remain. There is something which the research assistants was one of the judges and I think the registrar also helped. They compiled a example bench memorandum for uh, assistants to check when they prepare the files for the judges. But this is not only for assistance. This will be very valuable for a class like this. It is also valuable to judges. I, for one, I am not all the time with my nose in practice directives. And sometimes my research colleagues had to turn my ear when I want to be too lenient to transgress a practice directive and show it to me that it's not allowed. Uh, it's valuable, some of it will not have application. But from this, you will be able to make a very useful summary. Even if I did not touch on this particular point raised in here. Go through that, apply it to residual procedure, you will see there's reference also to 108 that will come. Make your own notes. And then tomorrow we can have, say, half an hour. Uh, luckily, I, I have the help of Ms. Mokumela. And then we can discuss the contents thereof. There's some things in here, and that is why it's not used a lot nowadays by researchers, it's too long. The requirement is only with that as knowledge and in the big background. If you have knowledge about that, you know how to check your papers. Where you find the mistake, you pick out one of these items and you put that in your bench memo. Otherwise, uh, a lot of the research assistants had complaints, and it's valid complaints, according, according to me, that this bench memos took them half an hour to an hour applied to a case. Uh, and they don't have time, therefore. But I give it to you because it's a valuable instrument for referencing. Very valuable. Jy net gauw vir my te tel, ek dink daar is genoeg. Maybe what I should do, and not tomorrow, because our time be become too short. The registrar has some time ago 
sent to uh, legal practitioners a memo and a guidance in terms of Rule 108. It's also, it will also be very valuable for this purposes. I will also give that out to you. You, you can let your eye go over it when you have time. And tomorrow we will discuss that when we come there. That's why, why then it's removed or struck. They must do it anew. If I find a matter like that in front of me again, and it's not reconstituted. Nowadays, I strike it from the roll, but I'm always threatening the legal practitioners. If you want to be the first to go on appeal for a final judgment given against your client because of your negligence, you will be the first. If this papers ever serve in front of me again, I will refuse it finally and give a judgment on that. And then you cannot reconstitute. You cannot place it on the roll again. You will have to go to the Supreme Court to get, get it overturned. And obviously, the, the, the fright for that is too much. How will a legal practitioner tell his... his, his, his uh, banking institution or insurance company, uh, look, I so messed up the papers and I didn't rectify it, although I was warned once or twice, there's a final judgment now against you. So you lost 100, 200, 400,000. So I, I think the fear for that is too much. Until now, it was not, I did not do it. I made some some other minor mistakes that that I'm uh, I'm liable for, but not that. I will see you tomorrow. You. All of you have a safe journey. <laughs>